that thou art, that meaning that which is worshipped as God, Saguna Brahman, the reality behind this universe, thou meaning you, the individual, you and that are the same thing. What is meant by Vedanta? It says um, in Sanskrit, you can, you can very easily rattle it out, you know. Um, Panchakosha Vilakshana Atma, Avasthatra Sakshi Atma. Um, the you, the self, who are the witness of the three states of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. You, the self, which is beyond the five sheets of the physical and the vital and the mental and the intellectual and the causal, uh, the Anandamaya, the Panchakosha Vilakshana Atma. So that Atma is meant by Tattvam Asi. Let's look a little deeper into this. Tattva Masi, that thou art. That meaning, in a very simple way you can put it, that meaning God, the God of religion. Thou meaning the individual, Jiva. That is Ishwar or Saguna Brahman, that, that thou meaning you. Now that seems to be a very radical statement. Does it mean to say, I am God? No. No, not in that sense. What it means to say is, when we investigate these two polarities, I, the individual being, what am I when I investigate? There's a technical term for this, Tvam Padartha Shodhana, again going back to Vedanta <laughs> The The analysis, investigation into who am I or what am I, and an analysis into what is God, and then you come to a synthesis, a seeing that what is the reality beyond God and beyond the individual. Here you see the big difference between Advaita Vedanta and all the other theistic schools of Vedanta. In fact, all the other theistic schools in different religions. Religions of the world in general and other devotional schools of Vedanta, they stop with three things, a triangle, God, individual, and the world, Jiva Jagatishwara. There is the world which you experience, and there is you, you are there, you experience a world with other people in it. And we have a faith, a belief in God. So you have a triangle set up. And religions end with that, the theistic religions. Advaita Vedanta goes beyond that, says that there is a deeper reality, a higher reality, beyond the individual, beyond the world, and beyond God even. And that it calls the absolute, Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss. Sat Chit Ananda. And it says, your reality is that Sat Chit Ananda. And if you would realize that, you would realize Brahma Satyam, that, that alone is real. And what about the world? Jagat Mithya, the world is an appearance. And what about me? Am I, am I an appearance or a reality? Don't worry, you are real. But you are real as the absolute. Jiva Brahma Napara. So it reduces the entirety of experience to one absolute reality. And it insists this can be understood, realized, within quotes, experienced. So, uh, and that, that is the purpose of spirituality, to realize yourself as that Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. The teacher teaches you that thou art, Tattvamasi. Spiritual life, you can have two broad approaches to spiritual life. Look at that statement, that thou art. That meaning, by now we know, that meaning God. Thou meaning you. Now, there can be two broad approaches to spiritual life. Even in the religions of the world, you see these two broad approaches. One is a that-centered approach to religion and spiritual life, God-centered. And another one is a, is a thou, you know, the inquiry into the self. A set of religions and another approach to uh, spiritual life can be, who am I? Search for God. That's one way of, of spiritual life. And what am I? Who am I? That's another approach to spiritual life. And it, one can see why this should be so. After all, look at the structure of our experience. Any experience any one of us ever has had is always subject and object. I experiencing this universe. I am experiencing that. If you ask the question, what is the reality about yourself, about myself? That is the inquiry into thou, in, into the individual. If you ask the question, what is the reality about this universe? That's the inquiry into what religions call God. So there are these two broad approaches. Now think about it. Apply it to the religions of the world. Christianity. What is it about? 
It is about the Father in heaven, about God. Islam, it's about God. Judaism, it's about God. In fact, all the Abrahamic religions are God-centered, theistic religions. And that's why one, one problem in the West has been, because this is the only kind of religion that the West has been used to, they find it very confusing. Here people find, it, find something like Buddhism very confusing. How can you have a religion without God? Whereas in India, it's no problem at all. For thousands of years, Buddhism has been there for 2,500 years, Jainism even before that. Buddhism, Jainism, even some, some of the schools of Hinduism, Sankhya. Even in yoga, though God is there, God is secondary. So these are religions or spiritual approaches which are not about God. In Buddhism, there's no talk about God. It's, uh, it's openly agnostic. In Jainism, there's no talk about God. But they are religions, less like any other. So, there are religions which are God-centered. In Hinduism also, there are so many religions, or so many, so many ways which are God-centered. Sri Ramakrishna is devotee of Kali, the Shakta approach. Worship of God as the Divine Mother. Worship of God as Vishnu. Worship of God as Shiva. These are all God-centered approaches. That, tat, that centered. Keep this in mind, that thou, that thou art. So there are these religions which are God-centered. And there are religions which, I won't say self-centered, that sounds bad. Even among spiritual seekers, right here, you will see there are these two broad divisions. You may not have noticed it. I have noticed it. When I was in, in our main monastery, I used to teach um, the young people who had come to become monks, brahmacharis, novices. And I would ask them, why did you, want to, why did you become a monk? What are you looking for? And I would get broadly these two kinds of answers. One group would say, I'm searching for God. I'm looking for God, God realization. That appeals to me. Another group would say, mm, God is good, fine. But I'm really interested in who am I? What am I? Who am I? You see, self-inquiry. So these two broad approaches. And when you compare these two approaches, you find some distinct differences. The God-centered religions and the God-centered mentality is likely to be devotional, worship-oriented, likely to be dualistic, likely to be um, temple, church, mosque-oriented, uh, likely to be ritualistic, likely to be, in a broad sense, ritualistic, um, you know, lots of worship and food and uh, celebrations, uh, joyous, and in con contrast, you will find the self-inquiry-based religions they tend to be more monastic in nature. Think about Buddhism. They tend to be more of an inquiry, meditative, rather than uh, devotional. They tend to be a little more intellectual, uh, inquiry-based. They tend to be more meditation hall-oriented rather than temple-oriented. Think of a Buddhist or a Jaina center, right? Both of these have their advantages and disadvantages. Both of these approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. <coughs> the God-centered approach and the self-inquiry based. The tat, that-centered approach and the thou-centered approach. What are the advantages and disadvantages? The great, great disadvantage of a God-centered approach, especially in today's world, is that the God-centered approach starts with and proceeds with for a long, long time on faith, belief. If you start with questioning, and skepticism, very difficult to follow the God-centered approach. If you say, how do I know God exists? Well, the book says so. I don't believe the book. The saints say so. Yeah, they were deluded. <laughs> then it is very difficult to begin on that path. The God-centered approach, God, the existence of God, is open to doubt. That's why in all the God-centered um, approaches, you will find a great deal of Effort is put forward into proving the existence of God. In contrast, in contrast, nowhere, nowhere you will find any effort put for, forward to prove that I exist. Nobody really doubts his or her own existence. Nobody. If you doubt, if you doubt, then who is the one doubting? That one exists. So I do exist. I exist because surely I am thinking. 
that is this real or not, if I'm thinking this, this I cannot doubt, then I exist. I exist because I think, therefore I exist. Vedanta would change that. Instead of saying, I think, therefore I exist, it would say, I exist, therefore I think. You know, there's a subtle point there. Even when we are not thinking, in deep sleep, when the unconscious, or knocked out in coma, not thinking, or in deep meditation, even that's an experience. It's, an, it's not an absence of experience, it's an experience of absence. If it's an experience of absence, to whom is, it, uh, uh, is the experience happening? You are still there. You are the witness of all your thoughts. And you are the witness of the absence of your thoughts too. So even when you're not thinking, that not thinking is also is lit up by your presence. So anyway, in the Tao-centered approaches, there's no doubt that I exist. But the problem is, there's a problem. The advantage of the Tao-centered approach is that there's no doubt that I exist. But the problem is this. I exist, but my existence is a miserable existence. I have so many problems. I have old age, death, relationship problems, parking problems, and, uh, <laughs> all sorts of problems. So what if I exist? That is the problem, isn't it? So now, whereas God's existence, no doubtful, if God exists, God is wonderful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, doesn't even need to park. So, <laughs> extraordinary, um, God has no problems at all, wonderful, glorious existence, but doubtful existence, if God exists. Whereas in our case, no doubt we exist. There's no doubt at all. Nobody has ever seriously doubted our own existence. Even the Buddhist who says there is no permanent, permanent eternal soul does not doubt that there is a continuing uh, series of consciousness flashes. So that's what the Buddhist says. So our existence is undoubted, but a miserable existence. Problematic existence. Unproblematic, doubtful existence. Problematic, undoubted, certain existence. Now, if you have noticed, I haven't bought Vedanta in it at all. Now I'm going to say, why did I say all of this? What does Vedanta do? That thou art, what it does is, it brings these two together. What Vedanta, the great insight of Vedanta, Dvaita Vedanta is, what you reach through the God-centered approach and what you reach through the self-inquiry approach, that-based approach, thou-based approach, you reach the same reality. By bringing them together, Atman is Brahman, that thou art. The realization is that indubitable, follow this, this is actually stunning, that indubitable, undoubted, undoubtable personal existence is also the infinitude of God. The unproblematic, infinite nature of God and the undoubted, certain nature of yourselves are combined. So you have an, a certain, undoubted, infinite existence. That is what you come upon, upon in Advaitic realization. If, you, if one truly understands Advaita, the more I read and study and try to um, uh, realize this, I see this is an undoubted truth. It's just that we don't see it. When you see it, it is with a, beyond any doubt. It's absolutely blazing forth all the time. Completely undoubted and completely problem free. This is the core idea of Advaita Vedanta, that thou art. Your existence which is infinite, your existence which is certain, but we surround it with problems. Vedanta shows you those problems, take them up. They are either the body's problems, they are the mind's problems, they are the intellect's problems, they are body, mind, intellect problems. And Vedanta shows you how you are not the body, mind, intellect. Avasthatraya sakshi, panchakosha, vilakshana atma. You are not any of them. The moment you see that I am not any of them, the limitations imposed by body, mind and intellect, when they disappear, you realize your infinite self, which is one with God. When you realize that, you see that not only is there no problem, there never has been. This whole conception of a problem and trying to get out of a problem, this is what is, what is called maya in Advaita Vedanta. It's remarkable good news. Not only that, not only that, it provides a foundation to, to all the other religions which have come before. It seems to be so contradictory, but this Vedanta, it provides, it does not dismiss, deny, 
um, the other religions, the other approaches. It gives you the rationale for them. What is actually happening in those, you begin to realize. From a Vedantic perspective, you can say, great, when somebody comes and talks about Christ or Krishna. And you can say, great, when somebody comes and talks about mindfulness and uh, the impermanence of, uh, of the empirical self. You can say, great, I know. I know what you're talking about. Both work very well. 